Hello, True Crimeers. This is the unsolved case of Morris Davis. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in Great Falls, Montana, and at approximately 11 p.m. on April 5th, 1985, paramedics had received a call to report to a house where there had been a shooting victim. The police were already there. The individual who had been shot was still alive, but barely hanging on. One of the ambulance drivers was actually a man named Cliff Davis. And when he got to the house, which is located on 1015 6th Avenue Northwest in Great Falls, he enters the home and the first thing he actually sees is the victim's boots on, you know, still on his feet. And he immediately, his, it's like he got drained because he recognized those boots. By an unbelievable coincidence, the victim in this case was a man named Morris Davis, Cliff Davis's brother. Cliff had to find a way to kind of collect himself and regroup mentally because he's just he's just now at the scene of his brother's potential murder, but he was still alive. They rush him into the ambulance, they rush him to the hospital, but by the time they get to the hospital, unfortunately, Morris Davis was pronounced dead. Morris Davis was only 23 years old, and at that time he was a delivery driver for a local pizza place called Howard's Pizza. The house he was found in was not his home. As a matter of fact, nobody actually lived in that home. It was a vacant house that was on the market. It was being sold. However, there was no for sale sign on the lawn, and it appeared that someone had taken the for sale sign out of it. The house is completely empty, there's no furniture, there is nothing, and there's virtually no evidence left behind either. The only thing they can determine is that whoever entered this home first, before Morris did, likely entered through a back door, which was there was some forced entry there. Morris had been shot multiple times. He had been shot with a 22 caliber. There were bullets left behind that they were able to take to potentially link to any future evidence. So how did Morris get to this location? Well, he was working that night as a pizza delivery guy. It just so happened to be him who took the order that was going to be delivered to this house. Now, because there was nothing in the house, the, the, no phone or anything, no phone service, this is obviously before cell phones, they determined that the call for the pizza must have come from a payphone but they never were able to trace that phone to like where exactly it came from. And they came to the conclusion that this entire thing was a setup, that, that they were going to lure a pizza delivery guy to this house in order to rob him because that was ultimately determined to be the motive. His uh, pizza delivery wallet, which I guess had specific money just for the, the pizza gig, uh, was stolen. It was no longer on his person. And his personal wallet, however, was still there with nothing stolen from it. They believe that whoever did this got away with maybe a couple hundred bucks, two, three hundred dollars, and that's it. And then they shot and killed this guy just for three hundred bucks. Witnesses in the neighborhood said that they saw Morris pull up in his vehicle to deliver the pizza and that they saw him approaching the door. They, they saw and heard him knocking on the house door, which the neighbors thought was strange because they knew nobody lived there. But after that, nobody really saw anything else. So nobody saw who the perpetrator was. Nobody saw anyone fleeing from the house. And so what was likely that what happened was that when Morris arrived and knocked on the door, they opened the door and probably put a gun to his face and told him to come inside the house. He was then shot inside the house the second he walked in. And then they think based on blood trails that he got away for a moment but they shot him again as he fled, and then they dragged him back into the house where they shot him several more times. The order came in at 8.34 p.m. That's when the phone call happened. And then by 9.20 p.m., he was dead. There was virtually no physical evidence left behind. They had nothing. They had, no one saw the people who were in the house. No one saw the people who entered the home. No one saw anyone running away. 
There was nothing. There was really very little that the police had to work with. All they knew was that he was murdered and somebody called from some number that they couldn't trace and lured a pizza delivery guy there. I mean, at one point they were like, well, was this maybe directly related to Morris? Was this potentially drug related? Was this maybe some kind of, there was, was a relationship issue going on and so someone wanted him dead, but they investigated all of those leads and angles and they, they couldn't come up with anything. So they did ultimately believe that this was a random murder or they chose a random pizza place and it just so happened to be Morris Davis. And then on May 11th, 1988, three years later, a man is pulled over. And the reason why this man was pulled over was because it had been stolen three days prior in Oregon. When police searched that car with that driver, they found two receipts in it. And one of those receipts was for a pawn shop where this individual had pawned a 22 caliber weapon at the pawn shop. Police go to that pawn shop and they're able to reacquire that 22 caliber. For whatever reason, they decide to test that gun with uh, Morris Davis's case because I think they were just like, let's just give it a shot, right? This is a gun that was pawned in a by a guy driving a stolen vehicle. Maybe this is our guy. And this this was all happening 180 miles or so away from Great Falls. So it wasn't even actually in the direct area. So how they initially came to that, like, let's see if these two go together. I don't really know. But what they determined when they test fired the gun was that that, that 22 caliber was a murder weapon that killed Morris Davis three years prior. So the man was arrested, the guy who was in the car. He says, well, I, you know, the gun I actually stole from somebody else. And the gun was stolen in Oregon along with the car. This was like this guy's friend, I guess. Not a very good one, I'm, I'm guessing. And they looked into this guy who was in possession of this gun. And they, I guess, investigated him extremely thoroughly. And they came up with nothing. They couldn't, they couldn't even put him in Great Falls, Montana, when the murder occurred. So he wasn't even there. And so it is just an unbelievable coincidence, they think, that this gun just so happens to be in this stolen vehicle from Oregon, which is a completely different state. <laughs> so police find out who the gun's owner is in Oregon, and they've only really ever said his name is Rick. They've never actually released his full name. They asked him where he was during the time frame of the murder that happened three years prior. Well, not only was he in a different state, but he also, his son had just been born a few months prior to this murder happening. And I guess he had an alibi. I don't know how they can determine like three years prior, but they looked into it and they just, they came to the conclusion that this guy, Rick, uh, could not have not been the murderer either. They found no connections to this Rick guy and Morris Davis. They found no connections between the guy found in the stolen car with the stolen gun to Morris Davis either. Which is, this is all very strange because this gun that they said was the murder weapon was stolen initially from Rick's house in Oregon, then used to commit the murder, then somehow gets back into his closet in Oregon, where it then gets stolen again by a guy who pawns the murder weapon, you know, 150 miles outside of where the murder happened three years later. It's it's all completely bizarre. Nobody can understand how any of these circumstances came to be, but they were at that point sure that this was the murder weapon, so they had to figure out something, but they couldn't connect either Rick or this other guy in the stolen car to this murder. It was just, they had nothing. Fast forwarding to 1995, they decide to relook into the murder case of Morris Davis. They have the stolen gun in their uh, evidence lockers and they have ammunition. So now they do another test, another ballistic test on this gun. They said back in 1988 was definitely the murder weapon. Well, now with new people uh, doing the test firing and looking at it through the microscopes, they determined that in fact, this gun was not the murder weapon. It did not fire the bullets that were found in Morris Davis. So that person who did that test in 1988 was wrong, uh, very wrong. And it led them on these insane wild goose chases to Oregon with all these weird coincidences that ultimately were not coincidences at all because they weren't even connected to the case. And that really set them back 
a lot because they really felt they were actually onto something here that they were getting closer to finding his killer. But now they are all the way back to square one. And then fast forward to 2005, police in Great Falls, Montana announced they have a suspect in the Morris Davis murder. A man who did not come up on their radar way back when the investigation was initially happening. It was a man named Donald DeBray. So in 1986, Donald DeBray was convicted of the murder of a convenience store clerk. Her name was Suzette Pritchard. He had also committed other crimes like rape and burglaries, robberies, and so by, but he wasn't apprehended and charged with all of these, those crimes related to that murder and the rapes and all that until 1999, where he was found guilty of the murder of Suzette Pritchard and sentenced to life in prison. Profilers were looking into Morris Davis's case. They came across Suzette Pritchard's case. This is now in 2005. And... A profiler would link the two murders together. And so through that, they looked into Debray and they determined that he was in fact in Great Falls, Montana during the time the murder happened. He had actually committed a robbery um, in a town over also using a 22 caliber weapon. If that weapon has ever been found or tested, I don't know. It doesn't sound like they actually have the gun. So once all this came out, Morris Davis's brother Cliff would actually go, I guess, to the jail to talk to Donald DeBray. And through their conversations, Donald DeBray knew about Morris Davis's murder. Like he knew the what the house looked like that he was murdered in. Also seemed to know where shots were fired from based on like where the bullets entered. Like he knew all that, all that information. He knew information that no one should have known about. So that led to Donald DeBray telling Cliff I was in the house when the murder happened, but I was not the trigger man. And he never told Cliff who the trigger man was. But he never flat out confessed to being directly involved in the murder, at least not to police. And police really didn't have the physical evidence to connect him directly to the murder. Really all they had was hearsay and the guy saying specific information about the murder, but he also could have potentially overheard that somehow, or he could have read it in the newspaper. It's not really known for sure. However, if he was the guy, he went to his grave with the information because in 2016, he died in prison of natural causes. And ever since then, there has been virtually no progress in this case. Morris Davis's case is still unsolved. Nobody knows who exactly lured him out to that house. They don't know if more than one person was involved. More than likely there was. They don't have any witnesses. They don't have any, uh, you know, snitches, like jailhouse snitches. They don't have anything. No physical evidence, nothing. But you never know. Somebody somewhere out there might know the truth. And perhaps that somebody is you. They may have talked to you, said something, anything. And maybe it's a completely different person who did this. Maybe not even Donald DeBray. Who, you know, you never know. So if that person is you, you can always report your information to police anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the murder of Morris Davis, please call 406-727-7688. If you have any information that can help with this case, please come forward so that Morris Davis and his family can get the justice he rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, true crime, a rooney dooney dingleberry dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe if you're new here. Hello, my name is Mike. I tell many true crime stories here every week. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. Both of my TikTok pages are listed in the link tree in the description of this video below. So feel free to check those out if you want to. Also, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below too. Just send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add that name to the list. The list is over 6,300 names long. I pick the cases I cover each time at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But that is it for this video. So we will see you next time. And until then, ta-ta for now. True crime, Arunis. Dogs are playing.